All right, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Called Out Church, and uh, thank you for listening online, everybody that's listening out there. We last week were talking about rightly dividing, and we got to the point of talking about the two gospels, and we really dug into that and how Paul was basically, you know, having to defend his stance on what Jesus had taught him to the original disciples and even Peter kind of backing away even though he knew right and somebody actually brought up the fact that you know Peter actually had a dream where you know out of what is it it was like a, a rainbow that came down and then he saw all the different animals a sheet was unfurled basically from the heavens and he saw like a bunch of creatures and some were clean and some were unclean and god basically said hey you can eat of any of them and peter was like but those are unclean and he says it's all good peter you can eat anything i created right so the interesting thing, and this is just to add one of those extra conversations that happens on the side to the conversation, which is Peter knew without a doubt because God told him himself, right? It's all good. However, right, when the rest of the disciples came, it was kind of like a, uh, because they were still going by the law. Well, we also had an indication that, you know, some people were coming from James and getting into the churches that Paul was setting up and causing some confusion among the Gentile believers and what God had commissioned Paul to do and teach for them out of the gospel for the Gentiles, right? So... It then brought us to the question of, well, do Paul and James agree? And there's actually a little bit of a hint of what James really thinks and preaches. And it's almost like we believe some of the same things, but the application of is a little bit different, right? So we're going to go ahead and jump into it. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We ask that you help us to understand things just a little bit deeper and to understand the way that you set up how we are supposed to walk it out in the spirit with you. In Jesus' name, amen. So, we're going to go ahead. This is just me clicking back through what we've gone over already. And do Paul and James agree? So... James 2, starting at verse 14. This is what James says. What does it profit, my brethren, if some, someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? Do you see the question he's asking? Can, can faith save you without your works? And that right there in itself is a bold question, right? Because what is it that Paul has been preaching and preaching and preaching? Well, James is coming about this a little bit different. However, what I think he comes to the conclusion of is what we actually end up seeing out of Christians when they begin to believe and they walk in the spirit, right? We have a freedom about us. However, what ends up happening is, right, they say, hey, I can do whatever I want, but when I become a Christian, my wants change, right? So I think that's where James is coming from here when he goes into the rest of it. So let's read it real quick. Verse 15, he says, If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Now, there's a lot of people that will get into something, and they will get into these arguments that are just, <laughs> who are you to say, right? Who are you to come in between God 
and his relationship with his created being, right? So if it's between you and God or you see somebody else with their relationship with God and the way that they walk it out with him, that's between them. Right. But we see a lot of times people will say, well, they can't be saved. They're doing this, that and the other. Are you are you sure? How do you know? Maybe they do hear God. Maybe they do believe 100 percent, but maybe they're not following yet. Maybe they're being prompted, but they are deciding to walk differently. Right. Maybe they got that something in them, nagging them, pulling on them, saying, hey, let's go a different way. And they decide to ignore that. They believe they have put their faith in Christ and what he has done on the cross. But they at the present may be taking it for granted. Are they saved? Ah, that's a hard question, right? I believe they are. I believe that they've placed their faith in what Christ has done and they are still in a milk stage of their relationship with Christ. They're using anything as an excuse to get their cake and their ice cream and they are not choosing to mature. And because that, right, they stay in the same place. They stay in the same place. They stay in the same place. Are they saved? I do believe so. Do they mature? Probably not. Right? So, I don't think it's on us to say, you know, hey, you, you believe? Sure you do. You don't even act like it. Well, I know my feelings were hurt when somebody brought that to my attention that, oh, you believe? I didn't even think you owned a Bible. Ugh. I know from personal experience, that one cut me to the heart like, oh my goodness. You know, I, I say I believe these things. I, I've got all this knowledge that, you know, I got this relationship with God between me and him. But what am I doing with it? Nothing. I'm not letting anybody read my Bible, which is me, right? So... I believe that James, right, they, they had their, how does this tie into the two gospel thing? They had an understanding of, they were supposed to live it by the law, right? And this is James's part of the argument. You say you, say you have faith, but where are your works, right? And this is part of his argument, and okay, so let's bring it to this as well. He does have a valid argument, right? My wants change. Or the way Jesus says it, you will know them by their fruits. A good tree does not bear bad fruit. Right? So at some point tonight, we're going to get to, okay, so fruit. And we'll see what that is from Paul's perspective of what we should have bearing fruit. All right. So that's James part of it. But Romans 3 and verse 19, here's Paul. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is knowledge of sin. Is this a disagreement? No, it's not. It's actually Paul saying, we're not living by the law. James says, you have faith, but where's your works to go with your faith? He says, granted, you have the gospel of grace, and that is what you're preaching. But if they're walking it out in the spirit, won't they look a little bit more? That was James's point. Won't they have something that goes along with it? Won't they be bearing some sort of fruit? So, you're not trying to walk this out with the idea of thinking that I have done this for myself. No, you're saying Jesus has called me to something better and without him, I could not do it. That's different, right? Okay, so 
Verse 21 says this, But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and all on all who believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Through your faith, you are saved. Through your faith, you learn to walk in the Spirit. You learn. You learn. That is something that comes after the fact. Once you get the Spirit, you now have a teacher. What would be the point of having a teacher if you weren't going to learn anything? So that in itself says... There's a process we must go through when you re receive the Holy Spirit to learn how to walk it out with the Spirit. You got to learn. There are those that refuse to learn. They stay in the same place and they say, nope, not going there. That hurts my feelings too much. I don't like that. I don't want to grow. I'm going to be right here. A lot of people, when it comes to the point of growing right they they don't like the pains anybody remember what it was like as a little kid and your shins hurt really really bad because why because you were growing and that continues mentally in your spirit your soul when you come across some scriptures, when you come across some things that God's been trying to put on your heart, that it's time for us to go ahead and walk this thing out. And you kind of feel that, oh, oh my goodness. I need, to, I need to make some changes, right? So, but without Christ, we don't even get to that point. So, verse 25 whom God set forth as propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. Hold on. By his forbearance, he already knew, right? He already bore these sins ahead of time. He dealt with them, took them on, said it's all right. Because he knew what Jesus was going to do, the price would already be paid at some point. So because in his forbearance, God has passed over the sins that were previously committed, everything in the past, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness. Without him, you can't do this. You can't save yourself, right? Right? That he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. He did it. He paid it for you, right? So that's a little bit different because a lot of people try to take that, you know, faith without, without works is dead, right? They try to take, well, if you have faith, right, What's that supposed to look like? In a mature relationship with Christ, when you're not just on milk, when you actually get, go outside of that and you begin to grow and get past things, you'll start seeing people act a little bit differently. Right? The fact that they're not acting that way just means that they need to get off the milk. That's what that means. If they say they believe, well, one of the things... You have people come to you as a mature, uh, a mature believer in Christ. Well, what am I supposed to do? What's this supposed to look like? Well, have we taken a good hard look at what our choices have been in all of this? Do they line up with what God would have us do? If the answer is no, which you don't have to answer, because you already know what I'm talking about. There, there's a different way that we can talk to people without being condemning. This isn't between me and you. This is between you and God. And if you believe in him, he's already put it on your heart what needs to change. Straight up. Have you changed it? No. Well, 
That's why we're still here. Right? Because you have yet to learn what he has been trying to teach you. So, our part in this is not to judge them, but to point them back towards God. We're not the problem solver. He is. Point them back to him and say, what he told you, have you done it? What he has made you feel in here, have you walked that out? Right? Okay, so... Isaiah 64, verse 5. Check this out. You meet him who rejoices and does righteousness, who remembers you in your ways. You are indeed angry, for we have sinned. In these ways we continue and we, we need to be saved. So even Isaiah back then. We know what your ways are, God. But we still sin. We need to be saved. He was recognizing that, oh, okay, we got this law. We know what's right and wrong, but still we're unable to do it. And verse 6 says this, But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. Everything that we think inside ourselves is so good is worthless and dirty and nasty in God's eyes. Why? Because we're doing it without Him. All these other things that we're doing good, we have fallen short in at least one or two. Right? All have fallen short. All are unclean. Unless you have Him impute, right, is the word that He uses in Romans, or takes His righteousness and puts it on you because of your faith in Him. So, Old Testament prophets even recognize your works are worth what to God? Nothing. Because you're doing them all with inside yourself, even for them to do them. Right? They still, what this also means is they still had a level of faith that they were required to have in God. Not that they could do this themselves. But they were doing this in faith towards God that I'm trying my best to be what you call me to be. They didn't have the Spirit, so it was a whole lot harder for them. Okay, so Galatians 5 verse 16 says this. I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall be fulfilled. And you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. So that you do not do the things that you wish, but if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Interesting. How many times do we see Paul say this over and over and over Stop going back to the law. Stop trying to live by that. Stop trying to not eat pork. Stop trying to, you know, pay for your own sins. Stop trying to do that. Those have already been paid. You need to let it go. You did something wrong. What does Paul say about that? Renew your mind. Right? On a daily. Basically, and repent. Repent. What is repent? People, people take it and they define it this way. Let me say a prayer when I've done something wrong. That is not repentance. Repentance is actually changing your mind to agree with what God says. Does it mean you always do what God says? No, it means... I immediately understand and know that I am in the wrong. And you can openly admit that and say, I am guilty. Help me do better, God. Right? And he says, well, the good news, son, daughter, is tomorrow's a new day. And that's that. And we're done with it, right? So... Um, verse 19, now, now the works of the flesh are evident, right? So all the things that we're fighting against, it's clear as day what that is. What does that look like? So 
adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hate, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries, partying. <laughs> Uh, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So, the kingdom of God. How do I inherit the kingdom of God? Well, as you go through this and as we start to look at what the kingdom of God is, right? Jesus told us the kingdom of God will come near to you. Right? And a lot of people, when they see this, they think, wait, hold on. What does that mean? I won't go to heaven. No. What it actually means is the kingdom of God is everything that is lumped up underneath of him as a whole. Everything he created belongs to him. But the kingdom of God, right, which you want to be a part of, these things separate you from it. The blessings that can come from heaven to you, towards you, down to you, these things prevent you from getting near those other things that God has meant for you. Y'all follow that? So a lot of people think later when I die no it means right here right now the things that you do here and now cause a gap between what God has wanted to bless you with if you're not ready for it he can't give it to you if you're going to misuse mistreat and abuse the things that he blesses you with how can he give them to you Nobody in their right mind would. That's why in Galatians 4, it actually says, see, we're in 5 now. In 4, if we take this in context, he actually says that a child is treated as a slave even though he is master of all. So when you have an inheritance that is meant for you, you're treated as a slave at first. Why? Because you are put up underneath a guardian or a steward. And that's what Galatians 4 says. For a time. When? Until you become mature enough to receive your inheritance. So, we got all these Christians that are out there getting their tail kicked in all the time. Why? Because they have refused to mature to their inheritance, which is in the kingdom of God. Their choices have separated them. Those who practice such things will not get their inheritance. You follow. He's not saying you won't go to heaven. You're not going to get the things that were meant for you here and now because you refuse to mature. You don't want to learn your lessons. You don't want to graduate. You don't want to move on in your life from glory to glory because you're not ready. I want this. I like it here. I'm comfortable. Right? But... For those who want to progress and pursue and get past some things, you go to God and you ask the hard question, what would you have me do? And then when he tells you, you go, oh, that sounds hard. I'm a little bit uncomfortable. I don't know about this, God, but you asked me to do it. So, okay, let's do it. I'm scared, but let's do it. So... Then, verse 22, here's the opposite. The fruit of the Spirit. So those fruits that we were talking about in the very beginning, what should your fruit look like? If you are to bear fruit, what does that look like? This is really crazy because it's so simple. He says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such 
there is no law. If you are led by the Spirit, these things come out of you, and you don't even mean to. You don't have to try is the point. How many of us tried when we were learning the Ten Commandments and all these different things? Thou shalt not lie. Well, I better, I better not lie. I better not steal. Now I got to try to be good. Now I got to try to keep myself out of trouble. When you let God lead you, there's no more trying. All there is, is being. The way that we were created as a human being, you are just a being who is here walking side by side with God, allowing him to lead you through your life. It becomes a whole lot simpler when you say, what would you have me do? I'm not saying you got to be brainless and a fool. But the wisest question you could ever ask, what would you have me do? No matter what the situation is. Well, I got a problem. There's this or there's that, God. And he says, well, why don't we have an option C, which is this over here? And you're like, I never even thought of that. Anyway, okay. So... Verse 24, and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Do you hear that? If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So if you have been made alive in Christ, you have a choice to make. Are you going to walk in that? Or are you going to walk in what the flesh wants? You've got to make the choice every single day, <laughs> every day, right? So let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Romans 4, what then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. Ooh. You're just tallying up your debt. You're going deeper in the hole, trying to get yourself out of the hole, yourself. But if you give yours to Christ and say, you're the one that can do this. You're no longer going the opposite direction. Now you're working with him instead of against him. Those who think that they are accomplishing what they should be and they're trying to live by all the rules, all the laws. You're digging a deeper hole. Right? So, Romans 5 says this, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We're only here because of Him. We only have anything because of Him. Now, I'm going to come back to James for a second. Check this out. Does anybody, if we are going to go in this whole rightly dividing, who did James write to? Let's read it. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes. Raise your hand if you're of the 12 tribes. <laughs> Which are scattered abroad greetings. This is written to the Jews. This was written to the Jews. Are you a Jew? No. Whole one. You'll see. You have to be able to take some of these things into context. You have to understand 
when we saw that there's a gospel for the Jew and a gospel for the Gentile, he is teaching some things directly to those who he was appointed over. You all see where I'm going? We've got to have context, but does that mean what he wrote means nothing to us? No. No, as a matter of fact, 2 Timothy, we're going to skip down here to verse 16. 2 Timothy 3 says this in verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Does it mean we disregard what James wrote? No. It means we got to put it in context and understand that some of the things and some of the concepts are directly written to Jews for Jews, right? Paul, who was given as our apostle by Christ, right? Not to say he trumps Christ. No, he doesn't. He was called out by Christ to teach us to write some writings. Here's how the Gentiles walk it out now. And we got to understand that and be able to separate the two and start to see that, okay, wait a minute. Who was this written to? Was it written to the churches? Was it written to the body of Christ? You're the body of Christ, right? So when there's certain things written in a certain way, you got to understand, okay, how does, how does this apply? Is there a concept from this which can apply? Because when he says faith without works, too many people go to, you got to be doing, you got to be trying, you got to be living by the law again. No, stop mixing things up. Paul says by faith in Christ we are saved and we walk in the Spirit, we have a choice in this, does our salvation go away? Because that comes into this big mess too. Well, when you read things like this, or you read some of the things like, well, what is the kingdom of God? If this separates me from the kingdom of God, uh, if I don't know what the kingdom of God is, and I just make a lot of assumptions, I, I know what that's talking about. Do you? Are you sure? You have to ask questions. How many people have ever been preached to? You got to ask questions. If you're not asking God questions, are you allowing him to teach you? Who here never asked their teacher a question? They just sat in the room, stone faced quiet, never asked not one question. Well, I don't really understand this. Will you help me understand this better? Because I'm telling you, all of us, we go through things with God. He's trying to show us something. I don't get it. And he knows that. Why? So we go back. I tell people this all the time when I'm preaching. When people start asking questions, I actually know they're paying attention. I actually know that they are really engaged in wanting to know, okay, how does this actually work? What exactly is going on here? Anybody that says believe blindly, I, I think that is such a falsehood, it's not even funny. We all should be striving to understand. Why else would Jesus say seek? Right? Seek first the kingdom. If nobody seeks, if nobody asks God any questions, just, I got to, I got to just trust. Well, yeah, you got to trust him, but he's, he's also going to give you good reason to trust him. Is that making sense? So, ask questions. Dig deeper. Go further. But in all of this, the only way we can without putting the whole Bible in a blender and, and thinking that all of it directly says you, you, you. Some things don't. 
Some things are in the past, like the Old Testament and the law. That's what brought us to here. Right? Your faith has made you righteous. Yes, sir. So the law's out. The law's out. But too many people try to bring it right back in. To include when we talk, talk about spiritual gifts. I, I got to go do something or else God's not going to give me a prophetic word. I got to go do something or God's not going to heal me. Or I got to go do... Right, so you're you're trying to pay for him. Of his right, you're trying. Of his you're trying to make yourself worthy of the gifts he's already given. Yes, yes ma'am. But the fact of the matter is, as he says, you were never worthy. I was, but I put my worthiness on you. So now you are. That's a whole Covered. Thing to really <laughs> oh, yeah. So. Why you screwed up? Yep. So, we just basically have to accept that we can't do this without him, and as long as we can do that. We're exactly where he wants us to be. With him. I gotta be right here with you, holding your arm, Jesus. I gotta be right beside you. You said, good, because I already sat you down right beside me. I'm glad you started recognizing it, right? But that is all I have this evening. And I think we'll start getting a little deeper into some of these kingdom uh things all these different times the kingdom is brought up and here's where jesus says it and here's where paul says it and kingdom of heaven kingdom of god what all's in the kingdom of god well everything so uh danny if you'll close us out sir Father, we come to you in the name of jesus we just thank you father for this word and lord everything in your Bible points us to the cross and Lord you paid it for our sins on the cross and that you our faith makes us righteous and Father let's still help each and every one of us to not let the devil steal what you've already given to us. Help us to be strong and give us boldness and wisdom. In Jesus name I pray. Amen. Amen. Alrighty.